This time on Fifth Gear, Jimmy and Johnny find out where's best to put your money if you're after a capable but affordable off-roader, a brand new Suzuki Jimny or a second-hand Land Rover Defender. Jimmy, Jimmy. We get a first look and drive of the latest addition to the luxury crossover market, the Lexus UX. Should Jaguar, BMW and Mercedes be worried? It does go where you point to. I get exclusive access to two of the most famous names in British motorsport, Brabham in their BT62 supercar and a deserted Silverstone. It's quite the combination. I just love it! Vicky compares three second-hand off-road legends to see which gives you the most bang for your buck. Use the performance of that V8 to propel you forwards with a lovely noise. And it's the battle of the pocket rockets as the new Suzuki Swift Sport and VW Up GTI go head-to-head. -head. I reckon it's going to be a bit spicy, actually. Quite good fun. Now, if you've got around 20 grand to spend on a utilitarian 4x4, then the second-hand Land Rover Defender has always been the one to buy. But now, there's a simple off-roader that costs about the same, the new Suzuki Jimny. Can the budget Japanese underdog match the famous workhorse ability of the Defender? Well, I found the perfect pair of 4x4 fans who are going to find out. I am a Land Rover nut. I've actually owned four of these back-to-back, -back, and this particular one, it's mine. I, on the other hand, want to champion this, the Suzuki Jimny. And this new version here is the first brand new car I've actually spent my own real money on. So we're going to do three tests to see whether the pocket-sized Suzuki really can stand alongside the established 4x4 key. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah. Little versus large. Absolutely. We're starting with a gentle drive around the quiet streets of Bedfordshire, looking at comfort, build and drive quality. And me and my Land Rover are up first. You are now sat in automotive royalty. They've been building this since 1948 and it hasn't really changed. Yeah, it looks very dated and the ergonomics could do with a tweak. People were obviously a lot shorter in the olden days. What do you think? <laughs> this is it. That, that is it. Is this, that is, is, you, that, is, that it? is you. What? Okay, well, that right knee is already chafing on that. This left knee is touching it. It's hugely flawed. It's I, it is. As standard, they don't come with a radio, which is why you've got some aftermarket nonsense in it. And the uh, hazard warning light is from a Rover 800. And that stalk is from a. Like a marina. Yeah. Do you know what they're from? They're from a Defender. No, they're from a Rover SD1. <laughs> yeah, they are, yeah. It's a hand-built car, Johnny. It is a hand-built car. So, it's been cobbled together and it's quite an uncomfortable ride, especially if you're over six feet tall. It doesn't seem to have much going on under the bonnet, either. So what are we talking in terms of performance? 0-60 in 14.7 seconds. Oh, that doesn't sound brilliant now that you've said it out loud. Top speed, 81 miles an hour. 81? Eight. 80. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon that the only way I'm going to win Johnny around is by letting him get behind the wheel of my pride and joy. Those interior door handles, they're off something old and British. Crikey, the brakes aren't very good, are they? MPG, actually. Can we talk about that? I'd rather we didn't. Yes, OK, I admit that with an average of 28 miles per gallon, defenders have a bit of a thirst. But after a few miles, I think Johnny's starting to warm to it. Do you know what? I am enjoying driving this. Yeah? I am enjoying... Uh -huh. I, am, I am, I am. See, the awkwardness. What is it character It for? is character building. What is charming is it, it is a classic car that you can drive every day. I'm not going to lie. It's better than I thought. But when it comes to road driving, I think my Suzuki will have the edge. Let Jimmy meet Jimny. 87 mile top speed. So it's a little bit faster than your death. There's no escaping the fact that this accelerates faster, is newer, isn't cobbled together out of random bits, and has some nice in-car features, like heated seats, which I wanted to show off to Jimmy. Have you... 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 <laughs> Where is it? You have to find it. Oh, it's here. You have it's to there. find it. <laughs> <laughs> It might be seven years younger than my Defender, but it's still not without its flaws. What was that I just heard? That was the engine. That's 102 PS, screeching. Is that going to stop? 
that's it, we're in final drive now. It's 4,000 RPM at 60. <laughs> Have you ever hopeful. taken yours on the motorway? Yeah, it's a commitment. I'm not going to lie, it's a little bit of a commitment. So after an hour cruising around, what will Jimmy think of the chimney? Johnny? Yeah. The yeah. noise that... What, the engine? With that horrendous noise, what's yeah. this doing and not to 60 in? About 12 seconds. All right, so it's faster. Faster. Brakes are sharp. Brakes are very sharp, thanks for that. Yeah. So, first impressions are done. It's time to find out which of our four befores has won the first round. OK, braking. Oh, way sharper. I mean, this doesn't barely have brakes. No, vague as hell. Then we've got handling. I would say this is more comfortable. It's a smoother ride. Yeah. Daily use, that is way better. Yes. The underdog. One. The icon. Zero. Join us later to find out how our off-roaders deal with a towing challenge, something a workhorse 4x4 should take in its stride. Now it's time for us to get a first look and a first drive of a new model. Yes, it's the fifth gear team test. Today, the team tested the all-new Lexus UX. This is the first ever compact SUV from Lexus, going up against the likes of the Volvo XC40 and Audi Q2. And its standout USP is that it's a hybrid. So, Lexus UX. Yeah. See, I struggle with hybrids because they just sit most of the time on the petrol engine. And you can't plug this in. This is not a plug-in. It is a full hybrid car, which means that it can run in electric mode, but not for very long at all. In an urban environment, it does make sense, you know, where there's a lot of slow start-stop. That's when the EV thing kicks in. Do you like Lexus generally? I kind of do. Styling on this car straight away, I've got issues with it. What's going on with the archers? Look at the size of that wheel in that arch. Little wheels, massive arches. The first thing I noticed was a yeah. great big nose on it. There is a lot going on. There's a lot of lattice. Mm. Then we got to the boot. Oh, hang on. Where Jane. is the boot? Even when Johnny tried to rip it all apart, it was still... That's tiny. I mean, a couple of big cornflakes packets and you're done. Why has he got a dog? Where did you put him? Jump in, boys. My gosh, have you felt how soft the door handle is? It's so touchy inside. I'm just stroking the centre console. <laughs> it's so damn soft. It's oh, lovely. This is gorgeous. Can I bring up the colour? What do we think about the red? Love it. Yeah, I, I like it. I don't like it's what ox blood do they call I'm it? I'm feeling like Spider-Man back here. So the interior's on point, but how does the two-liter engine and hybrid system perform combined with a continuously variable transmission, aka a CVT gearbox? The first thing I notice is that I feel the clutch is slipping, but it's not it's a CVT. <gasps> CVT. Yeah. It's weird. Ooh. So basically, it's one gear and it just sort of expands Expand. with your speed. Yeah. It sounds like the car's hurting getting Yeah, hurt. it doesn't sound um, like it's healthy. The gearbox has got a strange feeling to it. You know, the revs don't go in a linear way to speed. Right, here we go. So now I'm in electric only now on blue. But you've probably done some serious charging from downhill regen. So this is just for city use. Yeah, I think, I the, think the, the EV is for congestion and cities, yeah. Now we're taking it to the cobbles to see if the chassis suspension and build quality live up to the legendary Lexus standard. This is amazing. Do you think this is amazing over here? The suspension arms will be having a hell yeah. right now. Uh, this is beautifully, is, beautifully yeah, that's cushioned. Impressive. Very quiet. Very, very quiet. Can we hear any squeaks? I don't you know. It's very good, this. Slight squeak. What's that? Oh, that's my right knee. Well done, Lexus. This is good, yeah. this. Now, the UX's chief engineer reckons it can match the performance and agility of a regular hatchback. So I've got hold of this basic 150 horsepower Vauxhall Astra, and we're going to do a time lap in each car. Three, two, one. Gosh, it's flying. Okay, the clock started. Oh, I can't believe you're flying. Oh, you're oh. fighting. That is absolutely shifting. Bit of a bit skin, then. <laughs> you find to go in a bit quick, man. Here he comes, here, here he comes, comes, here he comes. Oh, we're rushing to the edge. Here he comes. Oh, OK. Yeah, relax. 47, 47. 47, 47. Can you see it in the sun? So, let's see how the Lexus, with its 178 horsepower, compares. It's going to be quicker. You reckon? Here we go. No cheating, cheating. Stop watch on. 
Oh, I didn't actually. Now it's gone past. It's got nowhere near the grip. Whereas the, the Astra was ready to pounce out of the corners, this yeah. is just sort of slugging out of the corners. Yeah. He's quieter now than he was before. Yeah. It's less dramatic. Yes. But it does go when you point to it. It remains pretty level, doesn't it? It's not a massive amount of body roll. This isn't looking pretty, is it? Oh, well, I don't know, actually. It's looking actually quite close. Oh, you're afraid the oh, oh, oh. He's hanging on for longer. No, he's not going to make it. It's close, it's close, it's close, it's close. 49.42. 49.42. So, sorry, Mr Chief Engineer. The Lexus is a whole two seconds slower than a normal hatchback. Time for the scores. I'd rather have a Volvo XC40, and I'd probably rather have an Audi Q2. And that's why I'm giving this a six. Even though I'm not a fan of hybrid-style cars, I'm going to give the Lexus UX a seven. I really wanted to love this Lexus. Yes, it's got a smooth ride, but I think it's all a little bit mixed up, so it gets a six. We're going to give it an eight, which is a pretty good, solid score. Well done. Which gives the Lexus UX a respectable team test score of 27 out of 40. Coming up, I head to the track for an exclusive drive in a brand new hypercar, which bears an iconic name, the BT62 from Brabham. God, I feel alive. And our 4x4 face-off continues as Jimny and Defender go toe-to-toe -to -toe in their next epic challenge. He's working well under pressure, damn it. <laughs> Come on, then! Welcome back, and you're here just in time to witness me experience something truly remarkable. If you're a Formula One fan like me, then I'm sure you can instantly reel off a bunch of great teams from over the years. You know, you've got Lotus, McLaren, Williams, Renault, Red Bull, Mercedes, and of course Ferrari, to name but a few. And if you're a long-term fan, the name Brabham will also be on that list. Because between 1964 and 1985, Brabham cars recorded 35 Formula One race victories, winning four drivers and two constructor championships in the process. The most notable of these being in 1966, because in that year, the owner of the team, Jack Brabham, drove his BT-19 to the World Championship. And no Formula One driver before or since has ever won a World Championship driving a car bearing his own name. Sadly, in 1992, following a number of ownership changes, the Brabham name disappeared from Formula One. But that's not the end of the Brabham motorsport story, because in 2014, David Brabham, son of Sir Jack, announced that the family firm was back in business. Five years on, this is the result. The BT62. Costing £1.2 million, it's a track car designed to bring the Brabham name back to endurance racing at Le Mans. It weighs 972 kilos and has 710 horsepower. Now, do the maths, and that equals a power-to-weight ratio of 730 horsepower per tonne. It's no wonder that Brabham have booked one of the fastest and the finest motor racing circuits in the world for me to test it. I've driven Silverstone countless times, but never in something quite as fast and exclusive as this. But I can't just get in and press start. There's a lot of buttons, switches and procedures to get your head around. Yeah, we better. Yep. We leave this on nine. OK. You turn it off. And then put it back on. Yeah, OK. Finally, with a pull on the pneumatic gear shift paddle, I'm ready to go. to be produced by David's Brabham Automotive is powered by their own 5.4-litre V8 engine. Absolutely epic! <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it can hit speeds of over 200 miles an hour and feels like driving in its absolute purest form, which is not surprising given the family heritage behind this amazing creation. Myself and my brothers would, would race, and our sons have been racing, so the generations have, have kept going, but the name has, has sort of been out of the limelight for mm. quite some time. I thought I had to do something, and that's been a bit of a journey to, to where we got to today, that's for sure. It's a pure track-focused car. Yeah. It's got phenomenal traction, and the braking capability with the carbon-carbon brakes, mm. ABS, and 1,200 kilos of downforce. So when you come off the corner, you're going to feel it. And it's this colossal downforce from the airflow over and under the car and onto components like the rear wing that increases the vertical force on the tyre, virtually gluing the car to the track. In theory, it'll stick to the roof of a tunnel. You can drive it upside down. Ah, it's just wonderful. The steering is absolutely phenomenal. Soft, but positive. It doesn't make the car twitchy at all. So it's incredibly stiff. So all the inputs are going into the suspension and being controlled rather than twisting through the chassis. So that makes it pinpoint accurate. That carbon carbon brakes like in Formula One or you know Le Mans. There's ABS. It's a very, very serious car. But do you know what? It's very user-friendly. It's confidence inspiring. It's epic actually. It's a really special bit of kit. I love it. Brabham's say they'll be entering the BT62 in the new hypercar class at Le Mans in 2021. I just love it! God, I feel alive. I reckon Porsche, Ferrari and Aston Martin better watch out. Welcome back to our 4x4 Smackdown, where Jimmy and I are finding out what to do if you've got 20 grand lying around and need an affordable off-roader that can actually do some grunt work along with the school run. I reckon the Land Rover is the benchmark, a global veteran of war zones, jungles and deserts. While I'm on the side of the smaller but brand new Suzuki Jimny, which is proving so popular there's a one-year waiting list. And so far, it's the Japanese contender which has the edge, as it's the better car on the road with sharper brakes, more comfort, and it feels like it was designed this century. But now we're moving firmly into proper 4x4 territory and testing one of the key skills, towing. No room for Chelsea tractors here. They must be capable of real work. In order to be a good towing car, yes, you might need grunt, but you also need manoeuvrability and visibility. And that's why I've put horse marks on the back of your Defender. And I've devised what is known as an auto test. Expansive tarmac, many cones. You're going to start there where those cones are, slalom in and out of those cones onto the four cones together. Two revolutions. You're going to reverse the rig into the faux garage area and then make a mad dash for the finish line, which is that line there. Johnny may think it's all about agility, but I'm convinced that my Defender's brute strength is going to clinch me a well easy victory. This test is all about pulling power or torque. And I've got 359 newton meters of the stuff compared to Johnny Smith's weedy 130. This test is over before it's begun. Come on then, Johnny! Three, two, one, go! He by now has my accelerated. And I am already in second gear. Now, not the greatest turning circle. Even so, it doesn't take long to get used to manoeuvring this big old beast. Another revolution, and then he's going to go on to the virtual garage. Now, this is a little bit of Johnny Smith perversity, parking it in a garage. If anyone does have a horse book, you are parking it in a garage. You need to seek medical help. Now, this is going to be tricky for Jimmy. I hope. 
because it's my only way I might win. Oh, don't hit that cone. Do not give Johnny Smith the satisfaction. That's uh, looking all right, to be fair. He's working well under pressure, damn it, you ex-soldier, you. We are in the garage. To the line. Let's have some talk. Second gear, come on, all the way. And stop. What's he got? What's he got? The 80 stopwatch never lies. One minute, 14 seconds. Not too shabby. Come on, then! Ooh. That garage is not fair. <laughs> I can't see! I know, you can. You, you did better than I thought, actually. One minute, 14. That sounds a bit good. This is a good car, Johnny. I've been trying to tell you. Yeah. It's got character it and it goes. Yeah, it does go, actually. The grunt is there. Now it's time to see how my Jimny compares. It might not be all talk, but it does have some good things going for it. The Jimny is narrower and shorter. 15 centimetres narrower than the Defender and half a metre shorter. Oh, I've also got pretty good rear visibility. So that's a good thing, right? Three, two, one. Right, prepare yourself for some serious boredom, because that is going to take him a very long time. Come on, Jim, you can do this. You're a giant killer, man. You're a giant killer. Oh, you, oh, you naughty. I'm feeling the back shimmy right out. I'm clearly much more nimble around the turns. Time for a quick reverse park, and I'll have this all sewn up. He's jackknifed it. He's jackknifed it. Oh, I've overcooked that one, an absolute flute. That's horrible to see, that is horrible to see. All that visibility. Can't quite see. Oh, you this is panic setting in now. It's not working. Why is this not manoeuvring? It's like it's got no weight. As the seconds just painfully just drift away there. 114 to beat, and he's sparking. Go, 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 go,
It is incredible to think that you can get a Range Rover for that little money. So much car. I mean, even the Queen owns one. And I'm not talking about myself in the third person there. So what can I tell you about how it feels behind the wheel? I adore the high up seating position. And although you're never going to tackle Benz with the spirit of a hot hatch, you can knock the gear lever across into manual mode, knock it down one or two gears, and then use the performance of that V8 to propel you forward with a lovely noise. Range Rovers do have a bit of a temperamental reputation, though, so make sure you do the key checks before you buy. Oil leaks on the cam covers where the chain guards are have been known to cause problems. And on startup, listen for any ticking noises. It could mean that the timing chain tensioner is on its way out, and that will cost you about £1,800. Next up, the Toyota Land Cruiser J100. The Land Cruiser has been around for almost 70 years and is the workhorse of many organisations around the world that require a reliable and sturdy bit of off-road transport. This model has a 4.2-litre engine with 204 horsepower, which gets the big bruiser up to 60 in around 13 seconds, and it'll cost you about six grand. Inside, things are not as luxurious as they are in the Range Rover, and this car definitely drives in a more utilitarian tractor-like way. It's got a clunky diesel that's 79 horsepower short of the Range Rovers, but this particular model has got an awful lot of optional extras. On the bonnet, I've got a cargo mat for strapping down roadkill. I've got a bank of bunny blinding lights. I've got tow hooks, winches. I've got a snorkel up here in case I want to go deep sea diving. The Toyota has a reputation for being incredibly reliable and practical. Also, it's a bit less thirsty than the Range Rover, but there are still things to look out for. This has got a five-speed manual gearbox, but halfway through production, Toyota changed the four-speed automatic gearboxes to five-speed ones, which improved fuel economy. Happy days. However, if you're looking at a four-speed original auto, then sometimes there are issues between third and second gear, in which case a gearbox replacement will cost about £1,500. On to my final and most road-focused 4x4 of the three, the VW Touareg. The model had a major overhaul in 2010, and this 2016 version is all but identical. Here we have a 3.6-litre V6 engine putting out 280 horsepower. It is one of VW's oldest models in its range, and it still looks surprisingly fresh in here. The silver-coloured trim and the dials haven't really dated and it is a pleasant place in which to spend many miles. With an eight-speed automatic transmission, the Touareg can shift from standing to 60 in around 7.6 seconds. Not bad for a diesel SUV that weighs almost 2.2 tonnes. Of the three, this feels most like a normal car to drive when it comes to handling, and it's got the best body control. You can hurry it along some twists and use these gear levers up on the steering wheel if you want to feel a little bit sporty. It's sure-footed, it's competent. All the technology and the engineering just feels really fresh and modern. It just hasn't quite got the sparkle and character of the other two. It's expensive, though, at around £12,000, and the first thing to look out for is the prop shaft bearing that can fail. Replacing the full shaft is now considered routine maintenance every five years or 60,000 miles, and that can cost up to £1,500 at Volkswagen. If you hear a judder when changing from fifth to fourth, it could be a well-known gearbox problem requiring a new valve chest and could set you back around £1,000. So, after a day with these 4x4s, which would I choose? Each car has a different thing to offer and it is very difficult to choose. If you want easy living, then go for the VW. If you want a hard worker, pick the Toyota. If you want a combination of the two with a layer of luxury on top, pick the Range Rover. Right then, it's time to adjourn to our Anglesey track for a famous fifth gear shootout. The mission is simple. Put two like-minded cars together and find out which one's quickest. And this time, it's a couple of pocket rockets. These baby hot hatches are in a market of their own. Tiny, nimble, fun and cheap. In the silver corner is the VW Up GTI. 
Yes, you heard me right. I said an up GTI. This is the first time that prestigious GTI badge has been passed down to the up. The up boasts 115 horsepower, which will get you to 62 in 8.8 .8 seconds and push it on to 122 mile an hour. <laughs> It'll cost you just £13,700, but can it KO the competition? And that competition is waiting in the yellow corner. The Suzuki Swift Sport, a fifth gear favourite since the original was launched in 2006. <laughs> it's got 140 horsepower, which is enough for a 0 62 of 8.1 seconds and a top speed of 130. It'll cost you 18,500. On paper, it's quicker than the up, but as we know on fifth gear, it's not all about power. A well sorted chassis could give the VW the up a hand. I'm going to start with a Swift. Now, previous versions of the Swift had a 1.6 litre, normally aspirated, four cylinder engine. And this new version has actually got a 1.4, but Suzuki have added a turbo. And would you believe the performance and power figures have actually gone up? They've also managed to shave an amazing 80 kilograms off the weight. So now it comes in at 975 kilograms. So I reckon it's going to be a bit spicy, actually. Quite good fun. Do you know what? I mean, I'm doing 110 mile an hour in this little thing now. And we've got a six-speed gearbox. But the gear change is nice. All right, let's see what the chassis is like. On the turn in, this steering is pretty responsive, but I'm struggling for traction. There's a little bit of understeer on the way out. This sport model is 15 millimetres lower than the standard Swift, 40 millimetres wider, and it rides on stiffer suspension. Yeah, and all that's quite important because, as a general rule of thumb, small cars tend to be quite tall relative to their width, which means they, they suffer from roll. Now, this car's got um, a lower centre of gravity and, therefore, should be more stable. Yeah, there's a bit of roll, but it's not excessive. Time for a hot lap. There is a point where I, I can't accelerate any earlier in some of the slow corners because I just get understeer. So I've got to try and use the chassis on the entry phase of the corner to improve the lap time. So carry more energy in, just like that. <laughs> come on, you little swift. Right, come on, more than 110. I think we're going to just do 111. 111. Come on, power, power, no wheel spin. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. That's all right. Right, come on, dash to the line, and bang. The nippy little Swift crosses the line in 1 minute 25 seconds. Let's see what the VW Up GTI can bring to the table. So, the Up has got less power, and it's 100 kilograms heavier than the Suzuki, but it does have the VW GTI DNA, so let's not be hasty. I mean, you can feel it's got less power, for sure, but the chassis is better, much more grip, although it has got traction control, which I just simply cannot find a button to turn it off, because it does keep interrupting my progress and changing the attitude of the car. I was able to turn the power-killing traction control off on the Swift, and that's bound to make a difference to lap time. Right, let's see what top speed we can get to. We're almost eight miles an hour slower at the same point than the, you know, than we were in the Suzuki. Yeah, this has, without doubt, got a much more quality feel to it. You know, it feels like it's better engineered. Steering's more precise. Yeah, it probably rolls about the same sort of amount, considering it's only got a one litre engine. You know what? It's pretty good. But can it match the lap time of the Swift? Time for a quick. Yeah, definitely less understeer than the Suzuki in the fast corners. Let's have a look here. At the first checkpoint, the up is half a second slower than the Swift. But it's definitely going to lose out down the straights. Yeah, I mean, I'm 10 mile an hour off where I would be in the Suzuki. And your brakes aren't quite 
quite as sharp as the Swift, but they have got a nicer feel. Come on, it's going to be close, but I reckon the Suzuki's going to have it. And by the second checkpoint, the up is one and a half seconds behind. Two more corners to go. Let's have a look at getting it quick. <laughs> right, up to the line. And stop the watch. By the end of the hot lap, the up is a whopping four seconds behind the lighter and more powerful Swift. Although the VW felt more premium and had a great chassis on track, it's just not quite swift enough to beat the Suzuki. Coming up, it's Defender versus Jimny, Jimmy versus Johnny. Yoga Plum Berry. As they battle out on a brutal off-road course. <laughs> oh. <laughs> In the final part of our 4x4 Smackdown. It's the final of our 4x4 face-off, where we're doing all we can to decide the best off-roader to go for on a budget of about 20 grand. A Land Rover Defender circa 2011. Or a brand new Suzuki Jimny. So far, the Suzuki's impressed on the open road, while Jimmy proved it's the Defender that has all the moves when it comes to grunt and agility. But now it's the part we've both been waiting for. The ultimate test of an off-roader. A custom-built 4x4 playground which boasts muddy hills, log rolls, ditches and lakes. It's a rugged test that'll decide once and for all which is best. First up, I'm taking Johnny out in the Defender. So, Johnny, I've got six forward gears and a reverse gear. I've also got high and low ratio and I can lock my discs, making sure I get all the power I need to my wheels when I need it. I'm still in high range. Yeah. I'm off the throttle completely and I'm just using a little bit of brake. The gearbox has both high and low ratios, which means it can use lower gearing for better off-road ability. Yeah, that's good. It's not breaking a sweat. We're not even sweating, Johnny. No, I am. It's, it's not. I am. So let's have a little feel of this suspension. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, my knee! You like that? My knee did that. Everything else did. Oh, you I have to feel friendly now. So you're just getting the feel of it now. <sighs> I'm going to go low range now. OK. I'm not going to lock my disc, because we're just going to ease ourselves wow. nice and gently over this. These move. I've they just... are, yeah, these are... So we're going over loose... Ooh. Oh. Now, we just lost traction for the first oh. time. I'm going to wind the window down and have a gander. Hang on, I'm back in. I'm just going to touch that now. Are you ready? Yeah, your mud flaps are dragging. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, we are getting movement. This is impressive. Oh, it's been oh. Long. You haven't ground out. So on the Defender, yeah. I've got 315 millimetres of clearance. Yeah, yeah. I've got a 51 degree approach angle, and I can yeah. wade in half a metre, 50 half. millimetres, comfortably. Oh, I reckon. Without I really be. worrying about it. We're going to go faster windscreen wipers. Come in, we've got to get third gear. Yeah. And then you've Barry. just got to... Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy! Jimmy! I thought we were going to kiss the trees. <laughs> Obviously, the Defender makes easy work of the piddly puddles, but when it comes to the more serious business of wading through larger bodies of water, best err on the side of caution. What do you reckon? I don't really know how deep that is. There's one way off-roaders check how deep things are. Like a plank of wood in a... Come Dip, on, dipstick, get out. Sometimes you've got to get a bit hands on and trousers off. Don't make this weird. You're actually going to take your clothes off. Some things have to be done. Oh, seriously. Seriously. <laughs> That's quite deep. What are you thinking? I'm thinking it's going to be fine. Yeah? Get back in the car. And we're just going to ease it in, Johnny. This feels deeper than it ought to. Water's coming in. Water's, water's coming, coming in. in. It's a land room. Look at this. Beautiful. Enjoy the view. We're, I mean, we've got a little bit of water in here. There's no, it's coming in through the tailgate. It's coming out the doors. Just open the... I mean, it's just a touch of water, oh, Johnny. Oh, so romantic. It's a proper off-roader, I'm telling you. That was impressive. That was good. Come on, let's go get the gym in. All right. 
I've got to admit, the defenders dealt with the off-road course impressively, but I'm pretty confident that my more diminutive Jimny can hold its own, even with Jimmy drying out his wet pants on my heated seats. I'm not even breaking a sweat, obviously. So we're in four-wheel drive. Four -wheel drive. Bear in mind, this is, this is um, an auto. I would have liked a manual. My, the one I bought is a manual, and it's a nice box, too. Yeah, we've got a button here, which is descent control. So I guess I can just deploy that. I can turn traction off if I want. I'm just going to let off and let creep, creep the auto. Let's see what it does. It looks like I'm going too quick. Yeah, it was fasted. Can you see it's using the ABS? Yeah, no, it's just, so it's just using can the ABS. Can you hear it? But yeah. Pulsing away. Yeah. Should I stay in normal? Tell you what, Johnny, you are driving. Oh, I'll leave it. You've, you've, you've primed me. Oh! <laughs> Oh! Ow! <laughs> yeah, I just went over a little hot. Uh, the rest of it's absolutely uh, fine. Actually, that's, that's actually good. I'm going to put it in low now. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Like the Defender, this gearbox comes with selectable low range for maximum off-road performance. Lower gearing mode gives me more low-speed torque for better pulling power on steep climbs and loose surfaces. And you're happy with this now, Johnny, because I don't mind. You can bow out at any moment. No, I'm going to I'm gonna do this. I'm going to do it nice you and can slow. admit defeat. Ooh. Oh, she's creeping along. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, hello. It's a beautiful thing. Hello. I didn't hear any scrape. We've got automatic windscreen wipers. Let's see what happens yeah. here. There we go. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, I had to smash the wipers on. Did you? Cause, yeah, because yeah. I, I didn't believe them. No. I'm starting to feel this car, Johnny. There's no doubting the Jimny's holding its own thus far, but I've got to admit, I'm starting to get a tad worried about that impending mud bath. Let's get you to stand on the outside of the car. I just want to see where we're at with, with the deep depth. Because in all seriousness, you know, if, if it's too deep, it's too deep. Johnny, if this is some sort of escape goating get out of it. Right, that is the depth of that, right? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. wow. That's like, yeah. Well, that's, that's over half a metre. This is only, what, 310 mil wading depth? What you're saying is, the legend that is, the Land Rover Defender has won on this challenge and therefore has won this competition. Today, in these circumstances, in that lake, yes, it has. Sadly, the Jimny had reached its limit, and I'd rather admit defeat than risk drowning it. Yet, the Suzuki has rugged 4x4 charm, mod cons and good road manners. But if you've got 20 grand to spend and want to buy something you can rely on when the going gets really tough, the Land Rover Defender is still the undisputed champion.